Bop. All right, YouTube, prefacing this video, join us. Join us at the round table talk at Deechworks. They sat us down and we got to learn a lot about fuel systems from Mr. Deech himself. So in this episode, strap in, enjoy, and uh, let us know what you learned. Yeah, my current chassis right now was my pro chassis before I took a break from uh, Formula Drift. So it's pretty much the same, you know? And with Adrian, it's been pretty easy to teach him about my car. Yeah. Um, but that one goes for a curveball. What so car are you driving? I'm just in a 240 right now. You yeah. Yeah. So I had a turbo set up, and then um, I deleted that. So I got a call from Golan Engines. And they were like, yo, Nate, we want you to get back into drifting. We want to support you. And so they uh, proposed to build some crazy motor, you know what I mean, to show off their skills. And I kind of coaxed them into like building just an NA platform that you and your dad could throw in because that was the, the people I was going to talk to, right? Yeah. That's where I was going to go drift was yeah. with that crowd. So, And then they've been selling motors, man. So you can just like buy the 144 motor. It's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, with that, and the motor made it through that. Like yeah, the motor continued drove, on. Yeah, he drove it on like the injectors caught everything. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah, so but yeah, just funny story. But that's how like we all got together, you know, like yeah. that's where I have never had any real like support um, in that, you know, so yeah. And I was like, who's the best? I think mean, that's one of our differentiators is the support. Yeah. You know, we really um, want you guys to be successful and we want to support racing in yeah. general, so um, yeah. it's just like we, like one of our core values is enthusiasts, yeah. so um, we want to, we just want to be helpful, yeah. Yeah. we want to help you guys succeed. So. I think the industry can tell, you yeah. <laughs> um, Moving on, injectors, uh, regulators, um, they all basically work the same. Um, there's uh, you know different routings uh, of the way you can plumb the lines. We have like an inline regulator, but the um, you know as far as the different models, different ratings, um, it just they accommodate different uh, line sizes. Yeah. So like our DWR two thousand is um, dash ten, ten right, and then our uh, one thousand is dash eight, and our yeah. one thousand C is dash six. Well, Adrian had some good questions on line size, right? Yeah, yeah. So. I'll show you. I drew up a little thing. You guys want to see it? <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, Nate's current setup. Oh, nice. um, I did my best yesterday to try and make it as simple as possible. Um, and I was wondering if there's anything that you guys recommend that we could make better. Um, I came onto Nate's team kind of uh, with the car already done. Yeah. Um, and so after this past uh, season, starting to learn his fuel system more, uh, there are just some things that I didn't know if like you guys came up with that are newer, that can help uh, make this more efficient. Um, but right here I have uh, all the pink is 10 AN and all the purple is 8 AN and we have a, it's a return right. uh, system. And uh, yeah, so one of the questions I did have was right in here, uh, Nate's setup went from 10 AN to 8 AN to fit the, he has a, the, uh, Holly EFI fuel rails, the sniper fuel rails. Mm -hmm. um, Shout out to Holly. <laughs> is there any benefit for it to being all 10 a.m.? I'm um, so it's, it's, so yeah, it's about 650. You keep running all 6 a.m. Okay, cool. So it's just like overkill. So why? Why? why the why lines are usually overkill. Okay. Yeah, okay. If, if somebody's telling you you have to run something for a certain amount of horsepower there, probably in the not you know. Okay. Yeah. And like the, the CTSV, 750 horsepower on E. 85 and you know, it's not soft. <laughs> you know, okay, because that, well, that's so they're 38s. 38s. So they're dash 6s. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's way overblown. Oh, you gotta have dash 8 to run more than 750. You gotta run dash 10 to run more than you know, 1,000 or something. Okay, that's good to know. It doesn't hurt. But it's not necessary. It can, is it like the same theory where you can have such a large line that it snows? No. Really. no. Yeah. Um, just, Expense, you yeah. know, it's hard to run around. Yeah, yeah. Around. exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, and there's so many different, um, you know, bottlenecks within a fuel system yeah. that it, it just, uh, again, it's, it's, it's very application specific. Yeah. You know, uh, we have a lot of tight radius turns. Yeah, um, you're gonna want to run uh, a larger line. Yeah. Um, because each of those tight radius turns will suck a little efficiency. I got you. But 
but um, in general, you don't need as big a lines as you Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, you and probably dash eight when you cross the thousand mark. Yeah. yeah. I know we're probably going to go over this in a minute, but as far as like fuel filters go, we run mm -hmm. one DW uh, one ten. Um, is there any benefit to running two filters, or is uh, we have a ten micron in it? Um, There's some kids at the track who are running like multiple yeah. checkpoints. Like, and two days. <laughs> 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 yeah. But or or like we don't have a filter on the return at all. Yeah, we don't have a filter on the return. We just have one going to the flow into the filter. Perfectly normal. Yeah. I don't see any issues with that. Okay. okay. I, I run multiple, but it's because it's just a redundancy kind of thing. And I see. Literally, you can just like I, I have our new spin on fuel filter. Yeah, so literally, I can saw that. Spin it on, spin it on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, as far as like check valves go, like one way check valves, is there any importance for it to be in? Because uh, we don't, we run one just for the, uh, the dump tubes, just so stuff doesn't go back into it. Uh, I don't any I don't either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there any reason that, like, should we put one in? Into the if the pump really, if the pump already has a check valve you're good. Uh, there's the only thing it does is whenever you you know turn the pump on and yeah. it, it primes for a second and then turns off it holds that pressure so when you turn the key there's already pressure there. Yeah. But if you're like you have it on a switch and you just turn it on, it's yeah. not doing you any good anyway. So yeah. you're having to put it all the time. But let's talk about the microns, right? You wanted to ask yeah. about. Yeah. I have a question about that. Yeah. So how how is the uh, the micron like range like derived? Like how, how do you figure out? If something's five microns or something's ten microns, it, what, what kind of testing? It's is it? determined by the component that's protecting. Yeah. So when you're you have your filter sock, that protects the fuel pump. Mm -hmm. um, those are like hundred to two hundred micron. Um, you know your your fuel pump is not a real sensitive component, so it can you know small particles just go through it doesn't cause any damage. Um, when you get so that's like your first stage of filtration before yeah. the pump. 100 to a mark, 100 to a mark, 200 microns is fine. <laughs> and then the other component you're protecting is your fuel injectors. Right. And um, basically, you know, the least precise is carburetor, that's 40 micron. Um, and it's really just the OE automotive uh, people that are building those components that determine uh, best practices for that. Um, some people like to run 40, mic 40 micron for E85. That's, I don't suggest that. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's two. That's two. Do that. Yes. Yeah, so the, the bigger the number, the, the bigger the part, the, the, the bigger the number, the smaller the mesh or the micron. Right? The bigger the mesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about like, if you're measuring yeah. like if like if it was a ten centimeter filter, then anything ten centimeters wide can go through. Okay. Okay. So like the micron is like if it's five micron, only something five micron large. Okay. Right. So, so this is a little 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 yeah. So yeah. the bigger the micron. The, the bigger the hole. The bigger the hole. Yeah. 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 It's, it's the size of the hole. Okay. Because in screen burning, it's the opposite, right? So when I'm, oh, really? when I'm screen burning, like, so we have uh, frames yeah, on mesh. Yeah, 156 is a lot. The whole entire mesh is on 110. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, like, would you say white ink or black ink is thicker? Uh, I would say white ink. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so white ink, right. Like white ink, we do like a 156 mesh count, but black mm -hmm. ink is super thin, so we do a 300 mesh count. So the higher the number, the thicker yeah, the mesh. Opposite, okay, yeah. opposite. Cool. Yeah. No deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> gauge size versus diameter. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Like, it's firmly, they purposely make stuff complicated. <laughs> um, so yeah, so on a carburetor, forty micron, a fuel injector, uh, an EFI port fuel injection, uh, ten micron, a gasoline direct injector, that's uh, five micron. Okay, those are uh, standards. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And there's not a go to go smaller. Um, yeah. Uh, it's not going to hurt things, but um, you don't need to. Yeah. yeah. Just trying to think like the chances of us, like, so when we're at Clutch Papers, I'd say we park pretty close to the track. So, like, mm -hmm. legit, like, dudes will come through and drift, and the entire smoke will come through our camp. Mm -hmm. And if we're filling up fuel, yeah. like, does that really do anything? Or not really? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, right? It can only hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, I don't think it's that sensitive. I don't think so. Um, At all my years drifting, like that's never been a real. Yeah. I, would, I mean, if you look at the bottom of your tank, it's still pretty clean. Yeah. So I doubt it. Yeah. Like, I'm just saying it's getting it. Just some molds. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So that, that's another thing wrong with our, uh, I guess, 
our current setup is that thing like the, I guess the surge tank just is it doesn't hold as well. Like as how much you it to the fuel cell? Like how yeah. those dudes have come loose. Yeah, and just like the way the surge tank is in, it's only held in by like three bolts, yeah. and uh, they tend to walk themselves out, and they'll end up at the bottom of our tank. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just it's just very. Like and the bolts like that. It's just aggressive. The drifting's aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. so when yeah. we saw we saw the, the new surge tanks, I was pretty stoked on that because it looks very robust. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very solid. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Is that our are you running our surge tank? No, no. Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I they guess. were actually drooling when I was yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's our drool line. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another question about is like fuel rails. Um, is there any re like what's does it help injectors more? Does it help with fuel rate or I guess flow rates more when you do a big fuel rail? Like Rails are basically BBMs. Okay. Yes. Yeah. They can yeah. help with yeah. uh, like plumbing. Yes, they can help with plumbing. If yeah. your factory rail only has one inlet yeah. and you want to run four turns. So like the factory LS one, exactly. it, it like goes in and comes across and goes back. Yeah. yeah. And that can screw the lot of things yeah. like yeah, and and yeah. some rails have some OE rails have some funkiness to them, yeah. Uh, yeah. but um, you know a, any aftermarket like high flow rail is you know I wouldn't be choosing a rail based on which one has the like, largest pores. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. It doesn't hurt, but uh, it's not really that big of a deal. So like a Dietrichs X one four four fuel rail is totally possible. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Uh, we do a lot of problems. That'd be cool, yeah. yeah. But we can um, like, we talk. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, like the rails, it, it's about <laughs> adaptability. Yeah. Um, obviously, they need to look good. Of course. Um, you have solid, uh, uh, what are those brackets? Or yeah, we do. So <laughs> our, our brackets are integrated. Yeah. They're not like bolt on, flimsy. Um, then, um, you know, you want to have good fitment yeah. of, the, of the fuel injector. So, you know, since we do injectors, it's, you know, we make sure that you have um, store right tolerances. Yeah. Um, you should be able to spin your injector. Yeah. If you can't, it's 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 too tight. Yeah. Um, it, uh, That's cool to know. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously, you know. Sometimes yeah, I still like, be able to wiggle it. Yeah. So nice type, really. I mean, once it's under pressure, you probably won't be able to do that. Right. Like right. when you first install it, if you can spin your injector, but there's some friction, there should right. be definitely some friction. Right. But that's but if they're just like stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah, that's real yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that can degrade your O-rings and make your O-rings fail. Gotcha. Um, but like we have uh, one eighth MPT ports on all of our injectors, so you can add. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you can do like a Schrader um, valve, yeah. um, gauge. or a gauge, or nitrous port, or you know, oh, just uh, yeah. fuel sampling. Um, is you have to some racing, they have to right. sample they the fuel. Their fuel so yeah, they yeah. Visual um, time. And then we have a 3 8 MPT on most of our rails. Um, whenever a fuel pulsation, pulsation damper might be important, um, so you can add that. And then most of our rails are compatible with um, the uh, return or returnless. Cool, cool. So those are the kind of things we bake into all of our yeah. rails. Awesome. Sick. Um, on the question. So those are like the main components. The uh, the regulator, the pump, the injector, and then these are all like the supporting components, um, some of which we've already talked about. Uh, filters, uh, rails, lines, bendings, check valves. Are you guys familiar with fuel pulsation dampers and what they do? And, I'm uh, not, no. Yeah. Um, so, can you explain those? Code? Yeah, so essentially an injector, an injector will, it flows, mm -hmm. whenever it opens, it'll create a pulse, a shock, and it pulls the rail. And so a pulsation damper basically dampens that shock. So if you have like a really large injector, usually it'll still deliver a large amount of fuel. Mm -hmm. Well now there's it has to fill that void. Right. And so and then it bounces back once that injector closes again. Right. So you have this pulsation going on in the fuel rail. I see. So it basically eliminates that. So it'll affect the flow. So what is one of those? The pressure spikes. It's basically yeah. regulated without an adjustment. Right. Exactly. Yeah, it has a little diaphragm that absorbs that shock wave. Um and uh will even out your fuel pressure. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and we've actually seen in a K-series car where the dampening or the pulse, they had a, there was a freak, certain RPM that where the pulses lined up right, where they couldn't get enough 
having he, he turned the literally in the map on the fuel map on DC, which maxed that cell out mm. when they would just go leave right there. It says whatever convergence gotcha, gotcha. waves or whatever we put the damper in it, it was perfect. That's a chance for better in it. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> the defense were terminals or defense? It's between them. Yeah, the applications yeah, that apps. usually hurt that need a fuel pulsation damper is one, does the OE rail have a fuel pulsation damper on it? If it does, you might call one. Um, if you're returnless, uh, you might need a fuel pulsation damper. Mm -hmm. um, a regulator on by itself might accidentally pulse a generator. Right. So if it's sort of not on there, then obviously right. it's convenient. Yeah. Got you. And these the K series car we run was we run dead end basically returnless. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, returnless Hondas and like the Evos had a similar problem. Um, people were upgrading the rails, especially like when they first came out, and deleting the factory fuel pulsation damper. They didn't know that they were doing that or that what it was or but it was like a very weird certain RPM. The only other thing you'll know, it could be a F FPD issue when you, there's like something that happens that's freak at a certain RPM yeah. that you can't tune out. Right. Um, because that's the harmonic resonance of that, those pulsations that they just, the frequencies all come together at a certain RPM and that's where it causes problems. Where does that dampener go? It like, can kind of go anywhere. It, yeah. um, Usually on the rail or near, near the rail. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. Cool. It's close to the generator. Yeah. So, yeah, regulator, dampener, rail? Uh, or dampener, regulator, rail? Well, on the return, usually the regulator oh, is so on the Okay, it's on the return. Yeah, it's not usually a problem on return because the right. regulator acts like a Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, yeah, if you're not seeing an issue right now, I would Of course. I would not, yeah. yeah. It, you'll know if you're having an yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, it's just good to know that that solution exists it's if you there. run into an issue like that. Oh, no, weird no, 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 no. <laughs> well, that's what we're going to do. over 5,000 RPM for some weird reason. Uh, it's, a, oh. a, it's a Corvette. It's, it's, Corvette. it's, it's probably not happening to you, but. Yeah, I'm still trying to figure out. You know what RPM the Eagles were? It was the case, like 2,800 or 3,000. The case range was 3,750. Yeah. Um. Then uh, these are other not necessarily fuel system components, but uh, components that monitor and control the fuel system that are good to keep in mind when you're building a fuel system. Um, fuel level sender, it's always good to know how much gas you have left. Um, uh, fuel pressure sensor, manifold, absolute pressure sensor, mass airflow sensor, TPS, um, your engine control unit, whatever your application calls it PCM, ECU, whatever. Um, and a flex fuel sensor is great for E85 um, or flex fuel use. And those are just listed because they play a role in the different fuel systems like when we kind of put them together. Um, and this is a, I just bring you want to go over this? Mm, you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, these are just a couple of things that are concepts that are pretty easy to grasp, but a lot of people don't know or think of. Um, and that's just the way that the, uh, the effects of pressure on different components. So um, on a fuel injector, you, know, you have the pressure, uh, the fuel's going through the injector, and so the higher the pressure, the more the injector flows. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on a pump, it's opposite. So the pump is creating the flow and working against the pressure. So the higher the system pressure, the lower the pump flows. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and the reason that's important when you're building a fuel system is if you are uh, undersized on your injectors, but you got a good pump, you can just increase your fuel pressure. Your pump will be able to handle it because your, your pump is oversized relative to your injectors, and it'll make your injectors flow more fuel. Gotcha. Um, conversely, and one thing that we see that you know people do trying to get more fuel in their engine, but actually hurts, is when your injector um, or when your pump limited, and people turn up the pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, to get more flow, they think, oh, I'll increase the pressure, I'll get more flow out of my injectors. Mm -hmm. Well, if your pump limited, um, you're turning up the pressure. That's not going to help. Mm -hmm. You're going to um, work your pump harder. You're we not did gonna actually get. It. More flow through injectors. I feel like clutch kickers like round two or three when we had low fuel pressure, and then we just kind of tried to open up. No, but we were we were fuel 
pump happy though. We had we had, we had three of those in there. But our injectors were clogged. Right. So we turned up the pressure. Yeah. And we yeah. Had it. I guess forced it through. Yeah, you're trying to make the generator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that would actually work. Yeah. But our so filter, filter was getting clogged as well. Like it was like kind of slowing yeah. down the fuel yeah. pressure. Yeah. And you couldn't get there. Right. We right. gotta go over how pressure drops affected. Right. Right. Um, the other thing to, to understand is delta pressure. So um, delta pressure is the, uh, the fuel pressure that the injector feels. So it's not the same as rail pressure. Um, in you know, the basic like uh, return systems that have a um, manifold reference on the regulator, um, you're going to have uh, the rail pressure minus the boost pressure is your delta pressure. Mm -hmm. And in return systems, you have a constant delta pressure. Um, in a returnless system, you have a variable delta pressure because you have a constant rail pressure. Um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then this uh, illustrates the idea of the delta pressure. Um, and you can look at the different examples. You know, example one, 40 PSI of rail pressure, um, zero PSI in the uh, intake manifold gives you a 40 PSI delta pressure because it's 40 minus zero. Um, the next example, uh, you have 32 PSI of rail pressure um, and eight PSI of vacuum, which is equal to 16.3 inches of um, this converts to PSI because it makes it easier to, yeah. to do the math um, and to understand the concept. So that gives you basically 32 plus 8 gives you 40 PSI. And what the, that's what the injector is feeling, experiencing. Um, and then under boost, it's different because you have, um, you know, vacuum, you basically you're helping pull the fuel through. Um, boost, you have boost in the manifold. It's pushing back against the fuel pressure. So in that example, you have 50 PSI of rail pressure and 12 PSI of boost pressure. Um, so that equals 40 PSI of delta pressure. Does that make sense? I had no clue about that. Yeah. To be honest. That's pretty yeah. Cool. So that's in, depending on the fuel system, you know, that, that's for, um, in this illustration, that's a return fuel system. Um, yeah. Yes, so like it'll work differently. To, the, you, you, you hook the vacuum line, you set your 43 and a half, or whatever, you hook it back up, it drops. Yeah, yeah. that's that second. Nice. Yeah. Uh, okay. so that's cool. Yeah, you always want to set your base pressure with your vacuum hose. Yeah. Not a just <laughs> right. hopes and dreams. Uh, yeah. Um, we don't know how carburetors work. <laughs> we don't do carburetors, so. Uh, don't have to. <laughs> <energy. laughs> um, so the basic return fuel system. This is one that most of you guys, this is what they're running, right? Yeah. Um, uh, you kind of have a list of the components that are used. Usually the operating pressure is a base of 43 PSI, and you have a static delta pressure. So that's because you have that reference, that manifold reference regulator, so your delta pressure across your injector is always constant. Um, pros and cons, they're easy. Uh, simple to build, simple to control. Don't need a lot of electronics with you know pressure regulators or PWM pump drivers or anything like that. Um, it can support a lot of uh, horsepower, um, but you have to have a return line, which is kind of just an added expense, not really that big of a deal. Um, and you can create issues with heat buildup in your fuel um, if you don't tune it right or use the right size fuel. Is there a problem um, with, so I guess, what is the ideal fuel pressure at the regular, at the, at the rail um, for most cars? Between <laughs> that a, 40 and 50, right? Yeah. And uh, even, so is 60 bad? No. 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 Okay. Cool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you set it and then you tune to it? Okay. Nothing wrong. Right. Good. Right. So there is a um, there is a pro and con a little bit, um, but if you stay in that 40 to 60 psi range, you're fine. Okay. Um, you uh, theoretically you will get better atomization at higher pressures. 
Um, I know Honda guys especially like to run like really high, yeah. <laughs> really yeah. high rail pressure yeah. or delta pressure because they think it's atomizing way better. And theoretically it does. Yeah. Um, uh, really low pressure, uh, um, but because of the, the, the drawback though on the high pressure is it increases your offset. So it increases the time it takes your fuel injector to open because it's having to work against that pressure to open. Right. Um, then on the other extreme, uh, low pressure, um, you're going to have poor um, atomization and then just also just lower, you know, flow. Mm -hmm. So you won't be able to support as much horsepower. Um, if you stay in that 40 to 60 PSI range, you're fine. Yeah. yeah. And then what about like heating the fuel up? Like what? Like we don't even monitor fuel yeah, temperatures yeah. or anything. Like, I would say if you're not having issues, I wouldn't really yeah. 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 It's really only an issue when you boil it. I see. Right. Because then you'll fake the lock. Exactly. Yeah. And if you're, yeah, if you're not having, you'll, you'll know when you have problems like you're killing your pump every, you right. know, all the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you make the yeah. lock, and, and it's usually caused by either really bad routing of your return line, like going next to an exhaust. Right. That's not a good place to put your return line. Right. Um, right. <laughs> which uh, happens. Yeah, we have that. A little bit of that gold expensive heat shield. Right, right. Yeah, we have, yeah, we have That's right. the cooling, though. Yeah. yeah. What was that? That's cooling, right? No. Is it on our radio line? No, we have. Our, our, <laughs> our oh, 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 coming off the passenger. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So we do have that, but we uh, we definitely have uh, protection there. I just don't know how hot it does actually get. Yeah. Is there um, any way to? If you're, if you're having issues, you'll know. You'll know, yeah. yeah. You'll know if you're having yeah. issues. So um, good thing that I have. Yeah, awesome. yeah. yeah. <laughs> the These DI's are killing me. Temperature swings can probably change. Tuning your cylinder, right? Yeah. 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 If you like to, like, you know, cars tune, the fuel's at 150. I mean, it does really. Uh, I mean, change your air to the inner room too. I it will, it will affect some things, but not this like a couple percent. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. But say if you start seeing, you know, giant, not yeah. just giant inconsistencies between them. Okay, yeah, you yeah. can see much more of an issue. You know, like if you tune to like it was like 50 degrees outside, and yeah. like, you're driving about your intake temperature like 200 degrees. Like, yeah. Oh yeah, the cars run a little lean. Right. That's, that's why. I see. So. Yes. Uh, yeah, temps I wouldn't be too concerned about unless you are having issues, like you yeah. said. Um, but um, I would say a majority of that comes from like if you size the pump arm or yeah, right. if you have way too large until you're turning up back to the fuel, right. and all that's getting heated up by being pressurized right. and also running through the engine bay, leaving you home up there. So nice. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. We're gonna make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you guys are doing most of Well we're we're running three DW four hundred. All the time? Uh, I don't see so that's a, a question I don't know the answer to. We have one feeding the fuel or the surge tank okay. and then two in the surge tank going into the into the But room. it is all the time. Like we're my car is like wired pretty old school, so it's like they're on, they're off. So I'm right. so waiting for a drift car that realistically part of what I would do is hook the other one up for redundancy. Yeah. And then whenever if that one has any issues, you just put right. the other one on. Right. Like my car, I have two 300s in my car. My yeah. car makes 350, we have maybe. Yeah. So it's like way over that. Yeah. But I really just have a pump there for a balance. Right. So I would just tweak it. What do you see? Uh, it's Holly's. Um, That's HP totally what I would do is probably put that second pump on the front of the pressure. So if you ever drop below, say, it'll kick 55 kick yeah. that second pump. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That way it'll do it for you. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that That's way you're not just keeping it. Yeah. 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 Right now, what we're doing is. Uh, Causing unnecessary heat. Yeah, it's right. Feel right now. Yeah, every time you compress something, obviously it gets hotter. So yeah. pumping it, compressing it, compressing yeah. it. And running it by your exhaust. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you're, you're not going to need that 400, you dual 400 to make the horsepower. No. Yeah. So just turn one of them off until you hit that, put a pressure, that pressure switch on it. Right. And then you, it'll automatically switch over if that right. pump dies or has any kind of issues. Because, yeah. like you said too earlier, like drifting is like in bursts. Right? Yeah. It's like rep pit, yeah. cars on, warm it up properly, 30 yeah. minute session where you're just going heavy on it, take it back, cool it off. Like yeah. it's not an endurance thing. You know? so, right. But when you are doing an endurance thing like a dragon run event and you're running, you know, the high horsepower cars through, you know, say Colorado and Nebraska, like Rocky Mountain Race Week, yeah. you are having major lot of issues and it's not routed near the exhaust, what other suggestions would you have? So a lot of that is going to be like, so a lot of those big drivers run a massive pump because they need a lot of fuel for yeah, you know, a very we, short amount of time. 
we like in my mom's car uh, that she used to have, well, we saw it, it's a Bel Air station wagon mm -hmm. that has a pro charge small block in it that makes 1200, you know, and we're running it for 350 miles and, right. you know, it's 110 degrees out. Right. And so we vapor lock it multiple times, you know, yeah, like mm -hmm. going out of the road. That's but, exactly the idea of having way too much pump. Because yeah. when you're cruising on the road, you're making what, 100 horsepower? Yeah. To, to just drive. No, with this, uh, I mean, probably four, five hundred. But you, you know, like you're like you're using. Like, yeah, yeah. that drive yeah. position yes. and that that yeah, yeah. yeah. that low on cruise control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Because yeah. we run it. It has an A one thousand. So, so you're but returning we, a whole bunch of fuel that's been yeah over, over a long distance. Exactly. Because the, I mean the, you know, it has a. The fuel tank is in the back, you know, it's all the way in the back, yeah. uh, up at the quarter. Yeah. You know, so you gotta go dash eight, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you, you can uh, down regulate that voltage, um, if you have like a switch or something, yeah. um, pulse width modulate the pump or down regulate the voltage, you gotta kind of put it in cruise mode so you're only running 10 volts yeah. uh, while you're, you know, doing your commuting part or your driving yeah. part. And then turn it back up to full full mode when you're for sure. You put uh, a cooler on it too. Yeah, fuel yeah, we're gonna do that. Build one, but that's like fixing symptoms instead of like yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes. Yes. yeah. It's like a band-aid. Because a lot of guys they'll do the uh, they'll take like the igloo coolers mm -hmm. around it and that and put the drives into it. Yeah. It's it's pretty cool, <laughs> but you know it, it's like all you have to do is like turn the voltage down a little bit. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. and you'd be fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's a problem we've had for. The last four years while yeah. you know, running that car, because like I said, you know, over the whole week you're you know, doing about 1,200 miles of road driving yeah. plus making five or so passes you know, yeah. throughout the week. So, so yeah, down down regulating that voltage will also make your pump last a lot longer. Yeah, yeah. especially if you're heating. Yeah. And you can only do so much. You know, you got a tank that's six inches on the ground and the axle is 190 degrees. And that's yeah. July in Texas or something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And that tank is like super tall, you know, and you know, it's gonna kind of obviously a lot of the car sits, yeah, four inches off the ground yeah. you know, when you're driving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 110 out. Yeah. Asphalt's a lot hotter than that. Yeah. 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 And then you get the Sonic Go or something. Oh, yeah. 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 Awesome. Sonic Go. <laughs> so, yeah, it's basically, you know, you have your, uh, your filters, um, your pre filter before the pump, your post filter after the pump. Feed lines go to the rail, a mini regular after the rail, and a return line. Basic common setup. Mm -hmm. um, next is uh, the return of the fuel system. Um, obviously, the fuel line doesn't return to the tank, that's why it's a return this. Um, the, uh, they usually operate at higher pressure. They do that because, like, especially in a boosted application, that delta is variable. So as you add boost, your delta pressure is going to come down. So they start at a higher delta pressure so that as you add boost, you don't get into like the 20s and 30 degree right. side range. Um, so you have static rail pressure instead of, um, and that means you have a variable delta pressure. Um, these are, uh, you know, the first application that kind of, that we ran into or I ran into that had this type of fuel system with a disease back in the day. It's not, um, all that modern anymore, but still modern at the time. <laughs> um, uh, the um, newer Mustangs and the newer Hondas. Um, pretty much, you know, the OE does things for different reasons than we do things in aftermarket. Um, they went to returnless systems because they can be controlled by electronics. Electronics are cheap, and um, uh, for emissions reasons, so they can delete the return line, um, and that decreases the possible areas where you can have the uh, evaporative emissions. <coughs> um, uh, the, the pros are lower emissions, um, cooler fuel, because you're not recycling mm -hmm. all the time. Um, don't have the return line, so it saves a little money. Um, cons, variable delta pressure. It's not a con, but it's it's a little more complicated to tune, but the ECUs kind of take care of that. Anyways, um, they are prone to vapor lock, and you can't make, you know, I mean, realistically, it's it's good for I think you guys say less than a thousand, um, yeah, maybe five hundred seven fifty. Um, you know, you could uh, 
make more power, but you know, when you're making 750, most people have I push the limits with the CTSV on a returnless system at 750. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of times it's just like what your aftermarket availability is. Right, that fits in your grill, there's no pump, so yeah. you kind of have to go to the um, So uh, you also see on the required components a couple of new things. So the electronics, the ele electronic manifold pressure sensor. Um, so you need to know your fuel pressure sensor and your manifold pressure sensor so it calculates that delta pressure because it goes up and down. So it knows how hold, how long to hold the injector open. So you need some of those electronic tidbits to run out of your terminal fuel system. It's scaling the fuel injector instead of scaling the fuel pressure. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, another picture that Sean used to update. Um, Sean, you're going to have so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I mean, the, the major take home is obviously there's no return line. and. Um, you also know to put a fuel pulsation damper in this. Um, this these returnless applications are where you're going to run into a need for a fuel pulsation damper sometimes, um, and you do need that mechanical pressure sensor. You know, and these are generalities. You know, there's ways to tune it and work around it without having a map sensor, but in general, to have map sensors. Okay, uh, one thing on this is we call it returnless, but there is a return regulator and everything. It's just usually in the tank. Yeah. It's part of the, the plastic bit down in the tank. Okay. Well, they kind of have usually. Not in our Are you returnless? The regulators, yeah. The regulators actually like. So it's just basically. It's not it's, really a regulator at that point. Yeah. It's not very. It's about the resolution is really low. We'll get about a certain pressure. Um, and then it doesn't have to be that accurate, though, because. You're compensating for it in the technique. Yeah. It's just respraying, basically recycling this. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Any questions on return systems? Brandon, what you got? I mean, uh, I'm in a Mustang, so just, like just okay. learning about all the systems and stuff. Like this is really sort of cool. <laughs> and I don't have much questions right now because I'm not looking at it, but I'm sure I'll run into some. <laughs> we'll call these guys. Yeah. In. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I like to put them on the spot. <laughs> I like it. I think Jean's being put on the spot um, as well. I know I said I'm okay. Then the next, you do kind of like from, from basic to advanced. Not necessarily from worst to best. Um, this is more following, you know, going from return to return list to demand regular, regulated return list to GDI. Um, that's kind of like the evolution of fuel systems by the OEs. So, um, these were, you know, the mid 2000s, 2010-ish um, is when they started doing the demand regulator returnless systems. Um, so basically, it's a returnless system that um, instead of just having that regulator that's always dumping in the uh, the fuel in the tank, like that's right after the pump, um, this guy here. It'll still actually, they still actually have this, but yeah, it's true. not used in the same way. Um, instead of having that, they pulse with modulate the fuel pump um, to uh, monitor or to regulate the fuel pressure. Um, it's all done via electronics. So you'll um, still have a variable delta pressure usually, um, a little bit higher operating pressure usually, um, and uh, that adds the fuel pump control module. That's something that wasn't in the, isn't required in the other systems. The fuel pump control module is basically pulse width modulating the fuel pump to hit a certain fuel pressure target. Um, the systems that you have, like in the more modern cars or more modern ECUs, where you can have like call your fuel pressure, um, usually it's because they have one of these fuel pump control modules uh, that will monitor and. It's kind of like pulse width modulating the fuel pump is the pressure regulator, if that makes sense. Um, there are backups, like if the pressure or uh, the uh, pump is going too high, it does have that. It does have the in the, in the tank kind of regulated, but at that point, point in this system, that's more of a pressure release model. Um, 
and then you, you still have the map sensor and the fuel pressure sensor. Um, pros and cons, uh, pump tuning capabilities. Uh, actually, we list that as a pro and a con. It's great. Uh, you can do a lot of things with it. The con is people mess with it when they don't know um, what they're doing or how it affects things, and you can really mess up things by doing that wrong. Um, calling for certain pressures that actually cause issues. Um, it's you know higher engineered, more sophisticated. Uh, it does have potential pressure spikes and um, does have potential uh, uh, vapor locking like the V. <laughs> so we just put a return system in the V um, basically because it was uh, vapor locking and it sits. You, know, you turn it off, it's fine. Turn it off for 10 minutes and um, it's heated up and it vapor locks. So what exactly happens whenever pressure spikes? Um, that would be pressure spikes like when you let up, like you're under high load and you let up the throttle all of a sudden. Oh, okay. Because you know where really for that fuel to go. You have that delay between the fuel pressure sensor, the ECU, the wiring, the controller, and then the fuel pump versus yeah. just a regulator that's a spring that's moving. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then it's also, you know, when you get more power. Is that they're really sense? cool yeah, or yeah. they're really complex? Yeah. And the, the thing that we yeah. always, or that I like to preach, um, I don't know what you guys tell people, but like, um, <laughs> when, you're, when you're starting with an OE car and you're modifying it, you know, yeah, if you're doing like a full on 1,000 horsepower clean sheet build, um, sure, you know, design, completely pull out the fuel system, design the way you need it, but lots of times people will delete a lot of this stuff instead of working with it. It's like it's a great system to a certain point. You know, um, and you know you can do uh, fuel pump upgrades, injector upgrades. You don't have to go straight to doing your module or doing a return fuel right. system. At some horsepower level, that makes sense. But you know, there's a lot of technology and cool shit built into the OE system. And so working against it or just deleting it, you know, if you know how to work with the system and optimize your fuel yeah. system, it saves you money because you're not changing as much. And it works better. I mean, the closer you keep the OE, the better it's going to work. So, um, yeah. yeah. But at some point, you're going to be, you know, at some horsepower level, you will need a bigger fuel system. Yeah. But until then, it's more fun to spend money on other things. Um, and then this is uh, based the diagram. The um, see, so added the fuel pump control module. That's uh, Pulse with modulating fuel pump to regulate the pressure. Um, and then it does still have an in tank regulator thing component, but it's more about just a PRV. Um, and that's about it. Um, I know you guys aren't here all day, so we don't need to go into GDI systems unless you just really want to. I'm all right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you guys know how search tanks work. Yeah, obviously we're using them now. Um, you know, just your customers and uh, just make sure they're plump, right? Those um, are the newest ones, huh? Uh, yeah, the, the five point five, five, five is the new one. Nice. Yeah. And then, um, and in the older one versus the newer one, like what did we upgrade? What changed or just design? And, um, um, a lot. It's, yeah, it's very different. Okay. Um, the new one is for intake pumps, yeah. like a 200, 300, 400. Yeah. The older ones were for inline. Okay. Okay. So there's a higher capacity. It holds three pumps instead yeah. of two, and intake pumps are more reliable, more quiet. Yes. They're submerged in the fuel. Um, yeah. Kind of work better. Cool. Cool. It's also staged. Yeah. yeah. You can stage it, which is nice. Yeah. Uh, and then it has all those sweet orange. It looks cool. Yeah, it yeah. definitely looks better. And then it's, it's, way better. Yeah. yeah, it's designed in a manner that it the actual design of how it sucks, you know, brings the fuel passage through. It creates a venturi effect that increases the flow. Whoa. Yeah. By what is it, ten percent? It's fifteen. What does that mean? What does that mean? So it's creating its own kind like, of vacuum and pulling the fuel. So oh. the main the main feeder pump that's in that. So there's basically there's pump number one and there's yeah. pump number two. 
yeah. if I'm in the one it's designed to be directly underneath the main outlet. Yeah. So you'll see if you look at the top of it's offset, it's not centered. Right. So that way when the main pump is flowing, it pulls the fuel from the other one up with it. It's just like a fluid dynamics thing. Yeah. That the way the pumps are arranged, it makes it where it would be, you know, three pumps all coming, you know, the, the flow from three pumps all coming together kind of colliding right. and decreasing the flow. Right. This is designed so that the uh, the pump in the middle is kind of allowing up the yeah. other one. There's a little bit of a cool, yeah. cool. for lack of a better term. I mean, that's a, that's a good bit of time. Cool, yeah. cool. Good point. Mm -hmm. No problem. No problem. I think this is what I do. I talk about features and benefits. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that a new regulator in that? Shows I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> that, hey, I got an assignment for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the module. Uh, back in the day, you had pumps on a stick. It was basically just a pump and a um, level sender. Um, now the module has venturi jets that keep the bucket full. The little bucket is like a, a built-in surge tank. It has filtration, pre and post filtration um, built into the uh, module. Like a lot of newer cars, like you won't see the inline filter. Um, both stages of filtration are built into the module. Um, yeah, so it's just, it can contains a lot of things in the module. And what we do when we do our modules, we, we might not be uh, the first to market sometimes, but like we're retaining all this functionality, and that's why it's harder for us to go to market because we're not just putting pumps on a stick. Right. You know, it's not just right. that they fit. It's like we want to keep the filtration and the maturing jets and all that, and that takes a lot more effort and time to engineer. Six months. <laughs> <laughs> that's the world. <laughs> that's just a good one. All right. That's that was good. really cool, though. Seriously. Yeah. Cool. Cool. That was awesome. You guys have some good questions. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, spend time. Seriously. Time.